Yeah, it sounds uh, antithetical that science and magic should show up in the, the same paragraph or the same sentence. Or the same title. <laughs> yeah. And yet, uh, when you, of course, look at the history of science, science has always been unraveling magic. If you go back far enough, everything was considered supernatural, supernormal, magical. And then slowly we begin to ask the right questions and figure out methods of testing what are these magical things. And so the magic we're talking about at this point has to do with the nature of human consciousness. So that's, that's why I'm talking about the science of magic, specifically about the mind. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with Dean Radin about his fascinating and controversial new book, The Science of Magic, How the Mind Weaves the Fabric of Reality, arguing that it is our consciousness that participates in creating the physical world, turning on its head the physicalist materialist paradigm that consciousness is just the product of the physical brain, nothing more. Dean, it's great to see you again. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, we're going to focus on the book for sure. But first, I want to jog your memory because you were on the very first season of Closer to Truth, which we shot in 1999, 26 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you told me something then that I will never forget. And you said at that time, you said, if you have outstanding sign capabilities and you go to Las Vegas and continue playing, you will still lose all your money. You will just lose it more slowly. So 26 years later, would you still say the same thing? Yes. For most people, that is true. Yes. Okay. So let me give a, a proper bio and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll begin. Uh, Dean Radin is a world-renowned sci and parapsychology researcher. He is chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and a five-time past president of the Parapsychological Association. His previous books include The Conscious Universe, Entangled Minds, Supernormal, and Real Magic. So, Dean, let's get to your book, The Science of Magic. You say that science is leading us to magic. Uh, so unpack that. Yeah, it sounds uh, antithetical that science and magic should show up in the, the same paragraph or the same sentence. Or the same title. <laughs> yeah. And yet, uh, when you, of course, look at the history of science, science has always been unraveling magic. If you go back far enough, everything was considered supernatural, supernormal, magical. And then slowly we begin to ask the right questions and figure out methods of testing what are these magical things. And so the magic we're talking about at this point has to do with the nature of human consciousness. So that's, that's why I'm talking about the science of magic, specifically about the mind. And, and what is the overall thesis of the book, The Science of Magic? Well, the thesis is that science has been studying the nature of consciousness for about 150 years now, systematically. And so we know empirically that consciousness is more than a purely physical brain oriented effect. It's more than that. Okay. So, I mean, I mean, you, you state that as an absolute fact and, and, uh, I've been known to oscillate on both sides of that question. So we'll, we'll discuss that in, in some depth and 150 years is basically, uh, the development of a uh, sci research, the society, uh, uh, for psychical research in the UK and, activities uh, during the 20th century and continuing now. Um, so when you talk about the the uh, science of, of magic, it have a tripart division. You talk about enchantment, divination, and theurgy, if I pronounce that properly. Um, and those three are magical kinds of words, uh, but they actually refer, as you've done, uh, to the aspects of the science of uh, sci research. Yeah, so it's true that the, the magical terms and the, the kind of quasi-modern terms of, of psychic research, when you look in detail at what was considered magical practice, it turns out that there's a one-to-one -one correlation. Enchantment, we would call psychokinetic effects. Divination is clairvoyance. Theurgy is the whole realm of survival type research. And so, uh, I initially became interested in this 
just because I've, I've read a lot, and re including in the, the esoteric literature. And I finally realized that the, the words have changed over time, and it's, it's shaped by culture as well, but they're exactly the same phenomena. So that's why we can say that there is a beginning of a science of magic, because we can take these magical ideas and practices and saying, what have we done in the laboratory that we can actually then correlate back to those practices? And it turns out that it's a very tight correlation. Okay, so let's go through each one uh, with some detail uh, so we can understand at least the framework. And <clears throat> then when we get into the book more, we can get into some specific, but just uh, give some color then to each of those terms in terms of what it means and what it means both in anecdotal knowledge that, of which there's enormous amounts, of course, and then uh, in, in the laboratory. Well, so we'll start with enchantment. Enchantment in, in the popular mind is things like manifestation. You, you, and you project your intention out into the world with the hope that it changes the world in some way to match with what you want. So in the laboratory, we take those kinds of experiences and we do experiments that are generally called mind-matter interaction or psychokinetic tests. Most of the target systems so far have been things like random number generators, usually based on quantum events, where the manifestation that we're hoping to see in the laboratory is that we can change the statistical outputs of the random generators in accordance with intention that we assign. And so more recently, I've been using optical interferometers because it's a little bit closer to what we understand in physics. But, but in general, it's about how do you do some sort of practice, not having to wear ancient robes and have candles and things like that, but more simply in the laboratory, you ask somebody to intend that a physical system change in some way. And lots and lots of different systems have been used, including living systems. So divination, in the lab clarification on enchantment would that include uh, like prayers for, uh, for healing well it can involve uh, clinical trials involving prayer because that's ultimately an intention right. however you conceive of it. it it includes having a petri dish with bac bacterial cells in it where you're trying to change the, the growth rate something like that and so there's there, again there's a broad range of different kinds of targets that have been used but they they're all similar in the sense that you're trying to enchant the world to conform with your will. Okay. And and the, that that language that I just used about using your will to change something about the nature, that is from directly from magical practice. Mm. Magical lore is all about impressing your will onto the world. Mm -hmm. So that, again, that's that's what we do in the laboratory using different terms for it. Okay. Okay. Divination in the classical sense is gazing into a crystal ball grazing into a reflective pool, those kinds of things, or the tarot and I Ching, all of those methods, which are trying to outguess typically the future, but not always, because it could sometimes also be like trying to figure out what's happening at a distance. So in the, the Lord of the Rings, for example, the, the eye of Sauron is looking through space and time. That's, that's the classical way of thinking about divination. Okay, so in the laboratory, we use terms like clairvoyance, and to some extent telepathy, it's trying to, to see into the mind of another person, or, or precognition, where you're looking through time. And there are many classic methods that have been used in the laboratory to see whether or not that is possible in principle. Mm. And the short answer is, yeah, it looks like it is. So the techniques that are used in magical practice are not exactly the same as what we do in the laboratory. The laboratory is always a, a compression and a, a opera, a operationalizing what people do in the real world. But we, you know, we squish it so we can stu study it in the lab. Theurgy is more difficult to study in an experimental sense because it involves the possibility that consciousness survives bodily death. So if your idea of consciousness is that we're somehow, we, we have a spirit or something that's inside our body, but it's not the body, it's something else, uh, well, so we study things like mediumship. So a medium is a psychic who specializes in speaking to non-physical things that might, might in some cases be departed loved ones. So what we can test in those cases is, is the information that a medium gets correct under double blind or triple blind conditions where they don't, they don't have any information about that departed person. 
but the information they give can be checked and, and you can tell it's correct. And then there's also a study of near-death experience and things of that sort. So there's something like eight different categories of evidence on the theurgy side. Theurgy on the magical side is quite different and could easily drive people completely insane because there it's typically about conjuring departed whatever's spirits or, or demons and it's a, it's more of a of a kind of a dark area of of magic so we again we we simplify the concept of that and we do the best that we can in the laboratory as i said mostly with mediums because that's what we can study uh, just to get at, at the concept that there may be non-physical entities of some type that can be contacted Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.